Welcome, Reggie Douglas Jr., a.k.a. New York Reggie, to Vlad TV. Welcome, bro. Uh, I'd like to welcome you and your mother, Miss Lena Candy Jackson, uh, to Vlad TV. We're honored to have you. Thank you. Uh, start with you, Reggie. Let's give people a little background on you. Reggie was born in Harlem Hospital on August 18th, 1970, to a 15-year-old mother and a 16-year-old father during the peak of the heroin epidemic, of which Harlem was the epicenter. In 1970, the heroin being sold in New York was purest and most plentiful in Harlem. Statistics from that time state that there were upwards of 250,000 heroin users in New York City, and about 80,000 of them lived in Harlem, while the rest came through on the daily to cop and bop. Reggie, your life began in 1970, but your story starts a few years before you were born with the meteoric rise of your father, Cisco Kid. Your dad's name and exploits were legendary in Harlem, when Harlem was considered the center of all things cool and cold-blooded. Can you describe briefly what your life was like for the first few years? For the first few years, well, I was a child, right? But, you know, I was born into uh, practically a, I was born a millionaire, you know, but I suffered some medical issues. That's that's my first few years. I suffered from asthma really bad. And my parents were told that they had to move me into a better environment than living on 116th Street and 218. So we were forced to move. And my dad was insistent that his child was going to live. To the point, my asthma was so bad to the point of being an incubator. All right. And they moved me uptown first. Then I think they moved me to either Queens or Long Island. And this the New York City air itself wasn't enough to preserve my life, so to speak. So it came a point when my father said, we out of here. We're going to Vegas. And they moved me and my mother into a mansion. And that was the first few years. And then, you know, my father was my best friend growing up. You know, you know, you start remembering things when you're about four. Some people even go back to three and a half. I start remembering things about three and a half, four with him. He kept me with him all the time, every way he went. And if I wasn't with him, he had me with her. But everything was him and me, you know, and um, he was just hell bent on me being different. You know, he didn't want me in the streets. He didn't want me around things. And... You know, eventually I end up, I lost him, you know. I lost my dad. I lost him. And I had to go sit in the funeral for the first time as a child and walk over to a casket and try to gauge why someone who's at my everything won't get up when I touch him. If I shake him, if I say his name, dad, 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 daddy, 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 daddy he won't move. And that was hard. And that was hard, and that was hard. But my mother, when them people went to close that casket, I went off. And my mother just came and grabbed me and put me in her arms and walked me away. And our life really began then because we were on our own at that point, and we had to figure it out. I'm touched. Do you know how Cisco got that moniker? Well, he was very nice to people. He, you know, everything he did in life was, uh, he was always helping people when he got his life together. And he, he just, he was just a good person. You know, he knew how to take care of his family. Mm -hmm. He knew that before he got to me. You know, his mother and them, they was very close. So he knew how to take care of his family, how to take care of people, how to, how to begin life. He was very intelligent. Cisco was very intelligent, you know, ahead of the game. To 21 years, he died at 21. But at 14, he was a man of 50. You know, you know how did what he I mean? get the name Cisco? He got it from his father. His father was Cuban. His father was Cuban. And his father gave him the name. 
His, his, the other side of his family is all Cuban, and they speak Spanish and everything, and they gave him a name. That's how he got it. So Cisco Kid was initially brought into the thing by a gentleman named Robert Paul, who was known throughout Harlem as Motorboat. Yes. What kind of man was Motorboat? Well, he was a country guy. He was a very country guy when I first met him. And he just he just lucked up and got into the business, you know, got into the drug business. And um, he was first using Cisco as going to pick up money and do stuff like that. Cisco was slick. How old was Cisco at that time? Maybe 13. He was slick. He was very slick. And he was always gaining for something, you know. He wanted to play basketball, but he was short. He played ball well, but he wanted, but he was short. He was too short. They wasn't taking no short guys. <laughs> so, you know, Robert Paul put him in a put him in a game, and after Robert Paul put him in a game, he uh he he moved up. Really, at the time, I, they used to say Robert couldn't count. Cisco was very intelligent. He knew the number game. The number game was good. So if he couldn't count. That was his dream. You understand that? Absolutely. Yeah, you know so, I do. I understand. Yeah. So I read in the book. Mm -hmm. um, you have a copy of the book? Right here, yes. Can, can I see real quick? I read in that book, excellent book. You wrote that? Yes, me and my mother. It, it is extraordinarily well written. Thank you. By far, and that's not urban lit. Thank you. So God bless the child. In that book, I read about how, or no, it was in part two that hasn't come out yet. Right. Mm -hmm. I read about how he and Chucky, his best friend, yes, uh, used to pitch pennies, which was something that in our days, children, we'd love to do. Right. right. And how he would pitch pennies, how he was uh, very savvy. Yes, and, and he 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 was gonna he was gonna come up by hook or crook. That's so right. So if his penny didn't land closest to the wall, and for those who don't know, pitching pennies was a game we played back as children back in the '60s and '70s, where we would pitch pennies up against the wall, and the one that came closest to the wall would win all the pennies that fell short. And if Cisco's pennies fell short, he would nudge them forward when nobody was looking. Or he would just grab them all up and take off running. <laughs> he was definitely a runner. Right? Yes. And, they, and they didn't catch him. And so he would, which spoke to his character and his uh, drive, you know, um, which were things that were looked at by older gentlemen in right. the game. Because, you know, right? he was a winner. He wanted to be a winner. So when you gain and be a winner, you're going to make it because you're reaching for the top. You're not reaching for the little small shit. That's why he ran with the pennies. <laughs> That's why he, he, you know, he nudged you and he, he took the pennies and ran. He had to win. That's so he was about 10, according to. Uh, he was 10. Two, right then. He was 10. Now, at some point in playing that game with them, he snatched the pennies up, ran down the street. The only person who pursued him, uh, the, the person who pursued him furthest was Chucky. Right. And when Chucky finally caught up to him, he's winded. Chucky said, he, he says to Chucky, look, um, I, I, I'm sorry about that, bro, but I needed to get you away so I could tell you something. And he pulled out a wad of money mm -hmm. back when money had real value. Right. And he, Chucky responds, where'd you get that money from, man? He said, look. Old head hollered at me, man. He, he gave me an opportunity, gave me a shot. This is where it's at, man. We're going to get this money. And he was probably 11 years old. Right. Maybe I hadn't 12. met him yet. I hadn't met right. him yet. So this is when his story in that respect begins. Right. When he steps into the game. Right. Um, how did you meet Cisco? And what was life like? for the time you and he were together? I met him at, I used to get on the bus. I, I, my mother moved from 137th Street to 116th. And I used to take the bus to go to Catholic school on, on, on Manhattan Avenue. 
and he was riding a bicycle. He had he had a snag of tooth because his teeth came out. He was just always riding a bike. They used to call him Bicycle C. So I'm ride, I'm getting at the bus stop. He here he is. Hey girl, how you doing? Pulling on my hair. My hair was long then. Pulling my little braids. And I didn't I didn't like him because, you know, he didn't not, not want to see. He was too streety. And I was a casual little girl trying to go to school. I was a little girl. Mm. He was way ahead of the game. He did that every day for almost two weeks. Two weeks. He did that every, he met me every day when I got off that bus. That boy was there waiting on me. So he walked me down the block to my mother's house and he kept on telling me, one day I'm gonna come back and get you. I said, boy, I ain't interested in you. I ain't interested. And then after that, he went away for about six months. He came back. I came home from school from, I, I left Catholic school and I was going to Wadley now. Okay, I came in my mother's house. My mother said somebody left, my sister said, Mama, uh, somebody left you some clothes, some coats here. I said, some coats? I went in the room, I stared him in a room. And after that, it was all history, man. It was all history. From that day on, it was all history. He took me shopping every day. He took me to the basketball games, took me to this place on 113th Street, a school where they was playing ball on 113th Street over there. It, everywhere, he took me everywhere. But I ain't know what I was dealing with. I ain't know that this man was selling drugs, doing anything. Cause I was young and naive. You understand what I'm saying? I didn't know. But I'll tell you this much, it sure was a wonderful life. It was wonderful. Until it wasn't. Until it wasn't. As is the nature of the game. That's, and that's the nature of the game. That's right. Until it wasn't. Uh, Reggie, this is for you. Who were your father's running buddies? It was Jesse Gray, Jerome Harris, he had Bat, he had Vito, Big Vito, he had Black Ronnie, he had Gregor, he had Hollis, he had Pop, he had Dave, he had Jelly Roll. It's so many names you can mention, man. It's so many. And these are the young boys that came up in Harlem. These are the first young boys in the history of Harlem to do what they're still attempting to do today, what they're chasing, which is not attainable because these were the kids that came up in the 60s and the 70s, the ones that people still talk about. You know, these were his friends that he went and got when he got on. He said, I'm going to get them. When he got it, he said, I'm going to get them. And Chucky was that, was really his, that was his man. That's like his brother. That's like his little brother. He tried to protect him so much, he wouldn't even let him be on a corner. We got, I got so many names in there, t -tie. All of them was, those, those were his guys, man. The names, several of those names that you called off are etched into the Mount Rushmore of uh, Harlem's underworld history. Those uh, who know, they recognize those names and those, and, and they have reverence for those names. Absolutely. Um, the death of Cisco Kid has been one of the longest running mysteries in Harlem's underworld history. Was it ever figured out who killed him? Friends. Friends. You know, it's certain things that we just don't, we just don't talk about, you know, because it was so long ago. But here's the sad part about death and the streets. Most of the time, most of the time, look at all the stories. Let's just play it back to my father. Let's bring it up to rest in peace. And mine. Yeah, exactly. Let's bring it up to rest in peace, even rich. And Friends, your brothers. And brothers. And then even in the 2000s, other guys lost their lives to friends right in Harlem. Friends. My father looked through a peephole and saw his friends, and he opened the door. And they chased him in that, in that room, and they betrayed him, and they broke his heart, and they blew his head off him. They put him in a box, the same guy that they laughed and joked with all their life. They ate at my grandmother's house. He ate at their house. They saved each other's lives before. Some of them were in the position they were in because of him. But they were willing to take a number and knock on the door and cross a friend. And that's the dirty part about the game. And that's, the, that's why these interviews are so important. Because we seem to miss it. We seem to get into the flash and the glamour and glitz of what the life is about. 
there's a flip side when your friend is standing behind you or sitting behind you in the car and your head hit the dashboard. Now your child is being raised by a stranger without you. Your mother is crying. Your wife is uh, in, in pure grief and forever. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's dirty, man. Friends. There's a lot of killing in the streets now. Mm -hmm. uh, but back then, the streets were extremely Machiavellian. And almost every move was a power play. Right. Uh, was that the case with your father, or was that other motherfucker jealousy? Well, well, here's the thing: it there are a number of stories, right? One story is this: that uh, the uh, 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 the mob wanted to get in the Harlem. All right, they wanted to get in the Harlem. They wanted to get on the west side. And that they were they were making their way in, and that they were coming to everybody. Yo, we gonna give it to you. We gonna give it to you. We gonna give it to you. We got it this much and that much. And he said, Nah, I don't need y'all for nothing. I don't need y'all for nothing. I'm getting my own money. And that was, you know, that was what I was told who he was. He didn't. He wasn't going for nothing. You couldn't. You couldn't bully him in no kind of way. So he he Nah, I'm good. Y'all can hold on to what y'all hold on to. And that they didn't like that. That's one story. And they sent a group, a group that he already had issues with, right, to come knock him off. And them, they uh, 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 employed his friends to knock on the door. Another story is, of course, it was jealousy. You got this kid that he came up and by 14, he was a millionaire. By 15, he's a multi-millionaire. You know, his woman is driving a white Benz with a convertible top. At 15, he got... What year was this? This is... At 15, he might have been... It might have been 69 when she had that Benz. 70. There 71. There weren't very many Benzes riding around in Harlem in 69. Of course. What? Huh. Cadillacs. Plenty of Cadillacs. Not very many Benzes. It wasn't as liberal as it became in the latter 80s where you could go and lease you one or... What have you? I mean, even if you had the bread, uh, a lot of cats didn't have the wherewithal to go and purchase a Mercedes Benz. That was diff a different purchasing experience than a, hmm. going to get a Cadillac. Well, he had two of them that I know of. He had a big brown four door one, and he gave the white one to her. White with a navy blue convertible top <laughs> and a navy blue baby chair with white seats. She That's had that. That's and that fly shit. Now that's that's yeah, cause okay. for jealousy. You understand? When you got a guy who turns sixteen, and he's the first black homeowner in Las Vegas to buy a mansion next to Red Fox, that's cause for jealousy. You know, and it's just too many different reasons why someone would kill you. Someone could think of something that you did to them two thousand years ago, and now they're in power, so they're gonna do what they do. Exactly. You know, it's friends, man. That's what this, that's why I so, people use the word friends loosely. That's one of the errors that all of us make, especially the ones of us that have done time, like myself. We use the word, the term friends loosely because these same guys that you're calling your friend and you'll do all this and all that for, they'll be the ones to betray you first. So we gotta be careful with how we use those terms how we gravitate towards them. And then for real, for real, it's 2023. The streets is practically over, man. Practically? Yeah, it's, it's done. Because guess what? Here's, here's, what, here's what they're doing. They're, they're betraying each other for two cents. Telling is approved. Rats tell on everybody. Come home, they get some money, and a woman is willing to, I hate to say it like this, a woman is willing to fuck him, stick his dick in their mouth. Excuse my language. But, you know, it's just, it's, it's too much. They come home, they ride around in cars, and they, next thing you know, they, they back themselves. So it's not even shunned upon. So if it's not shunned upon, that means when Joe Blow get locked up, who's with you, he ain't in there thinking about why he shouldn't do it. 
because it's either his ass or your ass. And he's the most interesting guy in the world, like Dos Equis. Right? So you know, the game is it's done. We got to find other ways. And there's so many other ways to get paper, man. Sometime after Cisco's death, a gentleman who was very close to Cisco and was himself controlling a major bag on the street introduced your mom to another reputable young hustler who called himself Red Jack. But initially, she shunned the introduction. Lena, who was the gentleman that made that introduction, and why were you initially apprehensive about meeting Red Jack? Jesse Gray. And Jesse Gray was Cisco's best friend, one of his best friends. He was my son's godfather. And um, I didn't know how to give myself to somebody that he was introducing me to. And he wasn't telling me to make him my everything, to marry him. He didn't say, marry this gentleman. He said, this gentleman would like to meet you. And I, was, I just didn't, I just wasn't ready. I had just had a baby by another gentleman. You know what I'm saying? I just had a baby maybe six months before that. So where was that gentleman? That gentleman had died. He had got killed. His name was Flat Top. Flat Top? Flat Top. Stanley Hilliard? Stanley Hilliard. That's uh, my cousin's uncle. He was married to my Aunt Letitia, my aunt. I got a uh, son by him named Chauncey Jackson. Elaine. I got, I got a son by him. That's extraordinary. Yep, I have that a son. That is crazy. Yep. Mm. I had a baby by him. I was with him for a year. Because I knew him before he went to jail. And the day he was getting ready to go in, just a week before, he said, one day you're going to be my ass. He said, one day. And he went to jail. He went to do six years. And he came back out. Cisco was dead. And I was standing in the sporting goods store. You know, Cisco had a sporting goods store on 16th Street. I didn't know that. Yeah, he had what was the name of it? He had a, the name of it was um, R&R Sporting Goods Store. That's the name of it. It was right on 116th Street. And what? 7th and 8th. He had a sporting goods store. Robert Paul's store was right next to his, and he had a sporting goods store. He had a restaurant in that block, too. What was the name of that? That was, that was named after his mother, Coretta. That was his mother's store. He had two stores, and um, Flat Top was over across the street at 215 when he, because Elaine family lived over there. Yeah. And he came over to speak to me and Jackie, which was Robert Paul, which was Reginald's um, aunt. He came over to speak to me. He said, hey, Candy, how you doing? I said, I'm doing fine. I paid it no mind. He was 10 years older than me. Too old for me. You understand? So I paid it no mind. A couple of weeks later, we went to, uh, 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 me and Jackie went out to a bar, and he covered the, all the drinks. And then he said, could I take you out? I, I just took a shot and went out with him. He was such a nice guy. Flat was such a beautiful man. You know, he was so soft-spoken. You know, you didn't get a rowdiness out of him. You know, to make him angry, you had to pull a lot. Right. You understand? He wasn't He wasn't the type of guy that should have died the way he died. Yes. He should have been in an accident. That's right. Not get his head blown off. Betrayed by his friends. Yeah, betrayed by his friends. Yes, Another friend story. Pretty similar to what to happened a, to, to what story. I had already dealt Almost with. Almost to the letter. Right. Only he wasn't in the place he came to. He, he went to it. Yes. He went to it. That's right. Yeah. That's crazy. And he did it on new, on December 30th. He did it on the day before New Year's Eve. He had just bought me a mink coat. I had just bought him a bracelet. He put the bracelet on and went. I never got the bracelet back. I never got my keys back. It was it was a lot. So when when Jesse was coming around to get Reggie, he would bring Reggie. But it was just, hello, how you doing? Nothing, because I'm pregnant. Y'all don't, you know, I'm pregnant. So it wasn't a relationship. I'm pregnant now. It took six months before I, you know, six months afterwards, he adopted my son, gave him Jackson, before he married me. And we became as one. We still together 40, 42 years later. That's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. You know, we turned out to be great you know mm. he loves me loves my kids it's the best thing ever man it turned out good because i think everything that happened in my life 
brought me to him. As I was losing these gentlemen, as I was losing them, I couldn't understand. Two years later, I'm back in the same shit. And then, you know, I'm dealing with another hustler. I was sick of them. I was sick of hustlers. That's what held me from wanting to mess with Red Jack because he was a street guy. But he needed somebody like me. He needed me, and Jesse knew he needed me. And that's why he put him there. He needed, he needed to know how to maneuver in this game. It was new to him. You know what I'm saying? And we worked out. We, we did just fine. Indeed. Yeah. And, and personally, sometimes, I, I actually, when I look at Chauncey, I see flat tops so much. I actually have to, you know, I just stare at him. He got all flat top attitude. Hmm. He's, so, he's soft spoken. He got flat top, love music. And this child loved music from day one. He into music. He used to sing. He used to do things like that. He used to, you know, I got a piece of tissue. Thank you. You know, he used to sing. And, and all of a sudden, he just started writing songs and getting his life together. He did great. I look forward to meeting him. Oh, he wants to come. He was saying he wanted to come today. He's in New York City. He said he might make it over here to see you. He would love to meet you. And I him. Yeah. Well, thank you. Hmm. That's a lot, man. This was a lot. But Red Jack has been a great guy. You know, he ain't no different than no other, hang, uh, no other hustler that been in the street. He's a great guy, man. Are you crying too, man? <laughs> Shut up. I ain't crying. <laughs> Don't you cry. This this is like touching, you know. It's because it's real. It's, you know, I'm telling y'all the real. It's just like, you know, women tend to think that, you know, that the man is that the man is the only one that hurt because he do the time in the jail or he loses life. But when a gentleman do time or a man loses life, the woman burns inside. We burn. We burn, but you gotta stay strong. Cause if you don't stay strong with this shit. You will fold like a paper bag. Yeah, and that's what it is. Yeah. Reggie, you you began to get in trouble uh, early in life. Um, you uh, you started to have issues um, with uh, controlling your temper and. Um, started getting into uh, volatile situations pretty early. Um, how old when you, or were you when you started uh, making the sorts of choices that led you into the penitentiary, into criminality, into criminality, prior to just criminal behavior in general? I would say I was about, when I really started delving into the, to the streets, not just young kid stuff, uh, between 11 and 12, between 11 and 12, what I, what happened was, you know, my family they always had a bunch of dope sitting around. There was so much of it that it was just sitting around sometime, right? You know, and um, I can talk about it because they served their time for it. They changed their lives. You know, some of them are resting in peace. So no one's incriminated, you know, and it's not no worry about anybody coming back and being prosecuted. But um, it was always sitting around, and, and it was a whole lot of it, right? So when I was around 12 years old, I I stole, I took the spoon, and I took a glassine bag, and I filled it up. And it's scrambled, it, I'm assuming. Yeah, scrambled, right? But it's high power, though. It, it take a, a vicious number, right? I took it, and I put it in my, um, I had navy blue army coat. And I had the North Lakes on my my feet, right? And I went up to Amsterdam, and I seen an old timer. His name start with a B, right? Got a few big brothers, right? Um, and I said to him, hey, man, look, look what I got. He said, let me see it. I showed it to him. And he said, what you want for it? I said, what you going to give me for it? And he said, i give you $1,000 for it. I said, yeah. He said, but I only got 500 on me now. Hmm. I said, take it. What year? This is 82. I'm 12 years old, right? 
82, 500 go a long way. A long way. He gave me 500. It's like having like $1,800. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Here's the wild thing about that. <laughs> I don't I don't know the, the value of what I have. Understand? So he couldn't have said, give, I'm going to give you three cents. I'm going to give you a hundred dollars for it because he knows who my family is, you know, and I don't know the value of the, the, what's in there. I don't know how good it is, how pure it is, how bad he might want it. He's looking at it probably saying, oh, I got one of the young Douglases here. I'm taking this. I'm, I'm getting this out of his hand. So I'm, I'm going to throw this number at him. And he gave it to me. I never seen the other 500 that he owed me. But. He took it and gave me gave me five hundred for it, and um, I took that five hundred. First lesson in the game. First lesson in the game. Know your worth. Know your worth. I took that five hundred. Me and my man's young boys that be on Convent and Amsterdam on Hundred Forty Sixth Street. We went and got us some weed from Hundred Forty Fifth and Edgecombe, and we went and stood. What'd you get? This is nineteen eighty two, eighty three. So what'd you get? What'd you get? What'd you get? Oh, we probably got about a, a Acapulco ounce. Gold. What? What is it? Oh, it was a uh, uh, tie stick. Tie stick. Tie stick. It was stick. Yes, you know what I'm saying? We yes. got the tie stick. They had it in the big bag. <laughs> we took it up there to Amsterdam. Didn't know what we was doing. We took the little bags, filled them up. Was telling them in front of the Jamaican spot, listen, we want Where? 149th, 148th, um, 50th in Amsterdam right at the door. Sweet. Okay. On the uptown side. So we're standing there, right? Listen, we're standing there, and we got the weed, and we're selling it. To us, we making all the money in the world. We ain't making no more than if we paying a hundred something dollars for the ounce, we making another two hundred dollars. But to us, it's all the money in the world. It's seven or eight of us. So we breaking it now. Here it go twenty dollars for you, ten dollars for you. And we doing this daily. You know, we doing it daily. But different rate of inflation. That that money that money went a lot further, especially oh, it sure if you had did. no overhead. You a kid. Yes. But the guns, the guns is not in the game yet. The violence is not there. But we just having fun, you know. We going to buy our little sneakers, buy our hoodies. I'm I'm fresh to death anyway because they keep me fresh to death. I'm in a game I don't even have to be in. I'm doing it because it's the law of the game. Like Hove said, it's the law of the game that keeps calling your name. It was calling me. You know, I wanted to do what all my friends do. They they riding the, the the scooters. They got the Q the QTs. QTs, baby. They got the QTs. Every they, they, color. They, exactly. We you know. So I I want to do that. I want to do that now. I don't have to wait. I don't want to wait for Christmas. Or the pooch, of course. The, of course, I want to do that. They, they all know. They on the block with the Izard shorts on up the hair. Yep. With the suede pumas on. Yep. You know, they got their chains and they fly. I want to do that now. I want to wait till my birthday. <laughs> I want to walk out the door now. Every time I walk out, Lena and Red Jack giving me, uh, here, here go fifty dollars. Here go thirty dollars. I got, I got money in my pocket, but man, that ain't enough. So I'm chasing. It's nothing like getting your own. What's on the corner? That's for the turnout. Nothing. I'm chasing it for nothing, though. That's the sad part. The result, the end result, was profound. You know? We're going to get into that. Hmm. There's a Washington Post article from June 18, 1991, about a period where it's purported that you and a couple of others went on a, quote, 18-hour rampage, end quote, that allegedly stemmed from a brother of one of your guys getting crossed and killed in the process of doing a deal. According to the article, quote, it was all over in seconds and Leon Bubbles Lipford lay dead, face down in a puddle of blood, shot eight times. He had dealt crack where he was killed on Clay Terrace Northeast, a notorious open air drug market and officials say he was murdered because he owed Reginald Douglas Jr. 4500 for cocaine. The article goes on to say, quote, that murder in August 1989 was only one moment in a year-long reign of terror that police say was caused by New York Reggie and Anthony D. Gardner, now on trial in D.C. Superior Court in Lipford Slaying. It's a litany of crime ranging from a drive-by shooting and various kidnappings to a shootout outside a funeral home. Douglas, 20, is charged with armed kidnapping and first-degree murder in the 1990 killing of 20-year-old Anthony Eugene Morrissey as his parents tried to meet a $20,000 ransom demand. Douglas also is charged with armed kidnapping and other counts stemming from a separate kidnapping in December 1989 in which he allegedly tried to flee after spotting police at the site of the ransom drop and ran the victim's car into and over a police car, flipping the victim's car five times. End quote. 
According to witnesses in June 1989, you fronted Bubbles a half a key, a coat. He cooked some of it and left the rest in a friend's car that he was using. But then the friend drove off without knowing the work was in the trunk, and apparently he ran into one of those random checkpoints, those plainclothes cops that used to wear those black bandanas with the skulls on them that used to just seemingly randomly set up all over the city. I got caught in a couple of those. And he got jammed with the rest of the work. According to the article, a witness testified that Bubbles had paid you 5500 But when you couldn't get any more blow, you told Bubbles that he had to knock off the $4,500 balance with work you were getting. he was getting from um, other people. The article details that just before midnight on August 1st, 1989, a witness testified that she saw Gardner, who was once on the D.C.'s police most wanted list, suspected in several of the homicides, walk past Bubbles and shot him in the back of the head. Meanwhile, Bubbles' friend was waiting for him in a van that was parked on the block. That friend later testified that he heard repeated gunshots at the same time that he saw you and someone else standing over Bubbles. The team you ran with in D.C. was arguably the most powerful team in the town at the time. It was headed by Michael Frey Salters, a very respected brother whose name I remember hearing ringing bells when I was moving around out there in 1986. According to reports, his nephew, Daryl Pucci Salters, was charged, uh, and along with you, in the both of the kidnappings. How did you, a kid from Harlem, get so tied in with a heavy D.C.-based team when they were reputed to hate New York guys? Here's the thing about that, right? The, I've told numerous people this. It's not actually true that they hate New York guys. Fact. All right. That is a fact. I'm telling you that. Um, because it's, there's so many of us that are welcomed. But it's all about how you enter another state, right? It's almost the same way like when you enter someone's home. If you come in there wrong, you're going to get either put back out or, <laughs> with, you ain't the, or with the, or you ain't leaving. Exactly. Not on your feet. And, you know, D.C. was one of those states. And it's probably the same thing in Philly, Detroit, Chicago, Detroit, Chicago, Chicago, everywhere. Yes. It's, it's the same way everywhere. It's, think about this. You can't come to New York and just do what you want. You can't go somewhere else and think you're going to do what you want. You can't take somebody's home. All right. So I never came into D.C. with that intention. I met Pucci at a young age. I met him before I even went to D.C. because my stepdad was really like this with Frey. Frey was like his brother. And Frey would bring him with him when he would come to New York to see my stepfather, Red Jack. And... You know, me and Pucci would run around. So when I got older, I got older. I'm running around the streets anyway. I'm getting in trouble. I'm getting in serious trouble. My stepdad said, listen, I could be able to watch over you, man. I could watch you. You're going to do it anyway. You're doing it when you're not around me. I'm hearing all about you all on Amsterdam, all on the hill. You're everywhere. You, and you're starting to get in real serious trouble. So I'm going to take you with me. And he took me down to D.C. with him. And he told the, this is the beautiful part about it. I'm home today because one of the letters that was written for me was by him. And he told the judge, I apologize for taking Reggie to Washington, D.C. at a time when it was the murder capital. I dropped the ball. But when he took me there, he didn't just throw me in the streets. He took me, he told me, here, Frey, this is my son. And I lived with Frey in Germantown in a big, like, mansion, and I stayed there with him every day. I didn't sell no drugs. I didn't cut no drugs. I didn't do nothing. I rode around with him every day in different cars. He took me clothes shopping. Every day he bought me an outfit. Every day he gave me money. He loved to shop. And he, he loved shopping. Oh, he loved that. And he Free took me, he did it every day. And, you know, I and... to see him in triples. Yeah. yeah he he's, 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 oh, let me tell you something. Frey, Frey for real, they could. It's no story that anybody could tell. That was his only thing he liked. It. 
Yeah. He didn't get high off enough. Yeah, he, he didn't he, drink. Yeah. But he and loved shopping. Later on in life, he didn't do none of that. But at, early, he, he, he got high. He got high. Yeah, he, he, he got out of that. But Frey was, trust me, he was, he was so honorable, it was profound. He's the reason why me and most of my friends that's, that, that were here that lost their lives have the etiquette that we have. You know, he took us with him to grave sites. He walked me and Poochie to grave sites and said, we putting these flowers over here. He sat us in front of prisons when he went on visits to see people. He took us with him when he went to his man's houses and said, pay for these lawyers. Here, you need money to go visit him in jail? Go see him. So we was taking that in. We was sucking that in. So my entire, my all of my friends, all of my immediate friends and people that's watching this show, they know who it is. They know who my friends are. None of us ever cracked. We never thought about, it wasn't even a thought to tell on one another because we love each other too much and we come from good stock. We're cut from that cloth. And we learned it growing up. It's just not what you do. You know, and, and all of them were your homie. When I did my 30 years, my mother will tell you this. Up until they couldn't do it no more, to their deaths, till they went to prison, they came to see me, man. They, listen, I have a friend named Damo, all right? Damo's in prison right now doing 30 years. I called Damo. I, I wrote him a letter on, on a Monday. Now, he's all the way in D.C., I wrote him a letter on a Monday and said, I need to see you. I am in Clinton. I'm in Danamora, man. I'm almost at the Canada border. I said, I need to see you, man. I didn't put a date on it. When the weekend came, he got the letter. He called my mother in Red Jack. He said, where is he? And I'm going to him. Take me to Reggie, man. He was there as soon as the envelope dropped in his mailbox, man. And they did that until they couldn't no more. D.C. is like a second home to me, and the guys from that city were extremely good to me, and they're real good dudes, and I have nothing but the utmost respect for them. Yeah. They are worthy of honor. That's a fact. And welcome home to all the men that's home now, all of them, no matter what the issue was back then. I'm happy you're here now, man. I'm happy you're here now. On July 16th, 1991, Michael Frey Salters was ambushed in his car at First and Bryant Streets in Northwest DC. His car had been riddled with bullets. Frey had been shot at least six times. A relative of Frey's was driving a van behind Frey's car east on Bryant when he was cut off by another car near First Street. Police said that. An occupant of the vehicle that cut off the van opened fire on Frey and an uninjured passenger in Frey's car then drove him to the hospital. Alpo is quoted as saying, Frey was about to get back in position in DC. He had a list of names of people he needed to eliminate and I was at the top of his list. I found out because I was feeding someone in his camp he wasn't taken care of. That same person ended up killing him for me, end quote. Where were you when you found out that Frey had been killed? I was in D.C. jail in Southwest 2. And a friend of mine went on a visit and came back and told me Frey is dead. I had spoken to Frey the night before because out there I spoke to him almost every day. You know, I had spoken to him the night before. All was well. You know, and um, he, he lost his life. But let's... let's elaborate a little bit about Alpo's narratives, all right? And I say this however I'm saying it, and, and who, you know, people out here, they gravitated towards him when he came home. But Alpo was a liar, man. Alpo was a liar. You know, he wasn't just a rat, he was a liar, all right? And Alpo lied on damn near every story he told. What Alpo did was simply, it was a, a beef about a girl, man. As Alpo was. wasn't on, man, Mike didn't make lists. My man didn't make no lists, man, and put him on a list. He wasn't that important. Alpo went down there, man, um, sucking dick. 
so to speak. He was jocking dudes. He wanted to be who them dudes was, but he couldn't. So, you know, um, he wasn't on no list. He wasn't important like that, homie. He made himself important, you know? And 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 the lies are crazy. And 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 the lies go for all of his stories. Let's let's we we could we could dig into all of that. Trust me. Everything he did was a robbery, man. It wasn't because somebody crossed him, somebody did this. Now he robbed every person. It was just for money, man. A lot of people never knew that in the few things that I've watched that were around him or about him, maybe not necessarily out of his mouth. People talked about him. He talked about a lot of things, but they never talked about the fact that for most of the 90s part, before he got jammed, Poe had been ducking and dodging, trying to stay out of the way of the police and feds or whatever. He was lining cats up left and right. A lot of cats never knew that. So you'd come and you'd cop, and then he'd have you stuck up, robbed, maybe killed for whatever you bought. Sometimes it was something real. Sometimes he took the work. Sometimes he took the money. Watch this. Let's just talk about this. Let me tell you how, how thirsty and, and dirty he was, how much of a sucker he was, right? And I'm telling you, I'm saying for anybody that hears this, I don't know how you could have anything good to say about a guy who calls someone his friend. Here we go with this friend thing again, right? We go with this friend thing again, using that word loosely. Your friend called you, in, and you already know that they got his brother somewhere. They done chopped the finger off of your That's friend's right. baby brother's hand. And he called you and say, yo, my man, I need you, man. I need you for this, man. I got this work. Let's just say, let's just say hypothetically his narrative is correct, which it ain't. Let's just say, even, even the story that people have gravitated to, they love this movie paid in full. They know. And like I said, it's a good movie. But it's a movie. It's a movie and it's a lie. All right? Well, movie, by definition, a movie, even one based on true events, is a fiction but that's too much fiction because now we're talking about people's lives. We're talking about real lives. We're talking about a child that's here right now. Rich has a child, and that child is under the impression maybe that her father betrayed somebody or his father betrayed somebody. And, that's, and according to the killer, right, he lost his life because of that. But how do you go to meet your friend, right? Look at this. And you go to meet him, and he says, I need your help. They got my brother, man. They got my brother, and they cut his finger off. And you say, oh, and you got 14 bricks with you right now? And you shoot him in his head, man. So what you really just did, you just shot him and the brother in the head. You killed him and Donnell. That's beyond dirty, man. That's ridiculous, man. And, you know, it, it's just too many lies. The ride up on the, 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 you know, it's just too much. It's too much. But people believe what they want to believe. Because guess what? At the end of the day, it's his story. These dudes tell these stories. Like um, Hove said, you know, I keep quoting Hove. I can kingpin you a rhyme. No, I can kingpin. I'm going to switch it up. I can kingpin you a line a dime at a time. These dudes are kingpinning their lines, man. Because they don't have nothing else to do. They're getting an interview talking about deaths, people they killed. Like it's all good. Like, like if that's something good to brag about. What you not going to hear me do, trust me. I ain't, I ain't, I ain't bringing nobody out the grave. So we're not going to sit here and talk about somebody that died. And, and I don't care if I hated them. They're going to stay there. I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm not talking about somebody that died. Because at the end of the day, I'm 52 years old right now. And somebody hurt. And, and I'm different. I'm different. You know, I want someone to forgive me for what I did wrong in my life. So how do I not turn around and say, guess what? Maybe he could have changed too. And what about the pain the mother went through? I know my, the pain my mother went through. She always talk about the pain that another mother goes through. So I'm not going to do that because that's not what it's about. We're going to talk and make a difference. We're going to let you see Guess what, homie? Friends 
That's such a, a, a turn. Watch it. Watch it. Please watch it. What was the ultimate outcome of your DC cases? My ultimate outcome of my DC cases, I beat every case that I had in DC. Every case. Literally. I had, I was charged with a, a murder, the one that you just read the article for. Um, I was charged with a kidnapping murder. I was charged with a regular kidnapping. I was charged with a, a conspiracy to distribute drugs while armed. I was charged with three separate gun charges in Maryland. You know, and this is all at once. Any one of those charges, if you were to be, say, you'd gone to trial against them, any one of those charges could have gotten you a lifetime. Absolutely. Listen, especially I was facing, DC. especially the murders and even the kidnappings. Because of how much it was, Kidnappers it was that in the feds. That's a, that's a standard fifteen years. Fifteen sentence. years, exactly. But my murders could have gotten me life. That's fact. But I went to trial. And the furtherance of some sort of criminal and enterprise the that yeah, got you the death penalty. Death penalty. I went to trial uh, on the one you just read an article about, and I was acquitted. A jury said not guilty. How was it, aside from having a very skilled lawyer, how was it that that was able to be the outcome of that? There were witnesses who testified to having seen you. I saw New York Reggie. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the thing, right? When it comes to a case, you know, the victim is not there to speak. So it's, it's witness against witness and it's a, a, a lawyer against lawyer. There were men that were uh, testifying in my case that were lying. That some of them weren't even in it, were not even there. Um, it was too many different stories in front of the jury. And uh, it was even a guy who bragged that night for that particular murder, when that's in the article, one you read, that he did it. He literally said he did it. And my lawyer said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go, we're going to call him, because he was in the feds. We're going to call him here as a witness. We're going to subpoena him to court. And we're going to uh, use the Fifth Amendment. He's, he's going to take the Fifth. Because the question we're going to ask him is, we're going to get the witness to say he did it first, that she heard he, heard he say he did it. Then we're going to ask him, did you say that you did it? Since it's a murder, he don't want to say he did it because... That's life. And that's a new charge for him. So we know he's going to take the fifth. And in Washington, D.C., you can't just say, I plead the Fifth Amendment. You have to s s recite the entire amendment. I plead the Fifth Amendment because the words I say may incriminate me. So when he got on the stand. The implication of guilt. Exactly. When he got on the stand, my lawyer asked him what's his, what his name was. She asked him. Did you tell such and such that you killed such and such that night? And his words were, I plead the Fifth Amendment because the words I say may incriminate me. My lawyer squeezed my hand. I looked over at my mother and I smiled. And we waited for the verdict. Because at the end of the day, that was reasonable doubt. Like a mother. And I was acquitted for that charge. My other charge, I was charged with that about five times. You know, that ended up being a charge that I ended up taking a plea to. Which one are you referring to? The Anthony Morrissey case. I took I took a plea to that in 2012. because That was the one where you ran into the police car at the ransom drop and no, flipped the truck? No, nope, that's over. another one. Oh. That's a whole other case. They did say a litany. A litany. That was another one. This was the alleged kidnapping alleged, you know, the, the murder, uh, and uh, I was charged with it. It was dismissed in 92. I went home. I caught the New York murder in 93, got 25 years to life for that. While I'm serving my 25 years, I was indicted on a RICO case with complete strangers. And the government took that murder from 1990 and threw it on their case and said that they started one of the guys on the case, which is my man, he started his crime life from 1990, right? And it was so many murders on the indictment that everybody just said, 
listen, I'm going to take three. I'm going to take this. Um, and my co-defendants even, I told them, I said, they offered me 10 years. They told me, man, take it and go, homie. Get up out of here. Take the 10 and go. And one of my co-defendants went to trial because he had life already. And he won. He beat the Rico. Yeah. He's one, he's one of them that go in that book. He beat the beat Rico. Beat the big bad wolf of he all charges. Yeah, he beat him. He beat him. No, why? Because the case was a lie from the beginning. We don't even know each other. We have no interactions at all. No letters, no phone calls, no visits, no nothing. They just threw me on a case. So I ended up taking 10 years for it because I wanted it to go away, man. At the end of the day, I was a changed person. I was guilty of it. And I, you know, I took it in. When I finished my 25 years, the feds came and got me to serve that time. Yeah, I what what went? Do you recall what went through your mind when you heard the judge say twenty five to life, and you hadn't even been alive twenty five years? Mm. Uh, listen to this, right? And it's hard for me to tell this story because I remember that day like yesterday, right? So I'm sitting in the courtroom. They told me I was guilty a month prior, coming from Rikers Island. She's sitting in the audience. She's sitting right in the, in the seats. And when he said twenty five years, I can take it. You know, I, I understand the life I live in, and this is the other side of it, all right? I'm young, so, you know, my chest is up. But again, like she said earlier, hmm. it's not only the men who go to prison or who get these bids and who hurt and who burn inside. They burn inside. So when that judge said, I am sentencing you to 25 years of your life, and she's no more than 30-something. She's 36, 37 at the time. I heard her shriek. <gasps> then you knew who the true victim of your behaviors were. Yes. I heard her shriek, man. I heard her shriek. And that's when all my bravado went away. Because this is my best friend, man. And she's hurting she's hurting and um that was it was hard man it was hard because of the pain she went through that day man and she couldn't get to me they wouldn't let her come over there and wrap her arms around me and say it's all right it's part of the punishment so they just walked me away and she had to go the other way and try to figure out how she's going to do this Without you know me. What? You know what? That, that day, that particular day, I left that courtroom. My husband was with me. I left that courtroom and I walked from that courtroom. I didn't realize I had walked almost up to 86th Street because it was, I had to walk it out. I had to yeah. walk it out. I didn't even see anybody else around me. It was like I was in that room by myself. And, you know, he's, and the judge said, if I could have gave you the death penalty, I would have gave it to you. And he said, but I couldn't, you know, because it's not allowed. Mm -hmm. But being young, you know, through all the tribulations that I had went through, that 25 took control of everything. I had lost two men already. And my, yeah, two, two great guys. And it, you know, it changed my whole life. His 25 changed my life. I went and got a job and went to work. Squared and up. got squared up, got my shit together and started doing what I needed to do for me. And all I kept saying is, God, just let me live long enough. Stay strong enough to take care of him while he in. When I had his brothers, I took his youngest brother to the prison. They had a relationship because I took him in the prison to meet his brother. He was never on the street with that baby. So him and his youngest brother, they became brothers, friends, whatever they needed to be from inside. Over a table. That's right. And we worked it fine. I never lied to none of them kids. I never said, listen, he in school. Forget that shit. He in jail because he did something wrong. 
And when he, when they was old enough to know it, when they was old enough to know that it was a murder beef, I gave him that. Ma, did he? Yes. He did all that. Yeah, that's how I did it. First time I found out that Reggie was doing anything, I was sitting. It was during the holidays. I was in Virginia Beach. We had a, a house in Virginia Beach. And I'm sitting there. Chauncey is young. We looking at TV. And this shit comes on TV. Uh, um, what's the name of that shit, y'all? America's Most Wanted. America's, America's Most Wanted. Most Wanted. <laughs> I'm sitting there. It's the holiday. And Reginald Pitcher comes up. And Chauncey says, who? What is that? And I'm trying to get him out the room, him and Dwayne, him and my other son. I'm trying to get them out the room. And maybe two days later, what is that my goddamn door now? Because they looking for this, this child. They Did you anticipate that they would show up? Huh? Did you anticipate that the police would show up? I, I knew they would show up. They came to my house. His man was in my house at the time, you know. And um, he was staying at my house because, you know, I was in the outskirts of Virginia. Nobody knew where I was. I used to live off of General Booth. I don't know where we, I forgot. We lived in Virginia Beach two times. We bought two homes in Virginia Beach. We had two homes. But so they came. I went, first they was following me for a while. I seen them. Then one night we sitting there two days later after that. SWAT is outside the house. So his man's in my house. I got to, I got to get him somewhere in my house. I put his ass in the attic over top with the white shit all over top of him. You know, the. A stuff all insulation. over the insulation all yeah, over his he was, ass. Up, he was up there getting up in the attic. He lungs was lungs full of fiberglass. Toe up, toe up. <laughs> they ran when they came to that door. We just sat there. I said, What you looking for? He said, We're looking for a body. So I said, What body? We're looking for Reginald Douglas, New York Reggie. I said, Well, he ain't in here. He said, You his mother? I said, Yes, I am his mother, but he's not here. They went everywhere but in that attic. Everywhere but in that attic where his man was. Best thing ever happened to us that day. And, you know, it was just a lot. It was a lot learning about Reginald, you know, knowing that he was doing things that I, I didn't expect him because he wasn't that kid. He wasn't that kid. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't train him that way. I didn't make him that way. You know what I'm saying? Everything was a silver spoon for him as when he was young. I made sure that he had everything. We was together for eight years before I decided to have a child. I had a child because I didn't know I was pregnant when I had flat top child. When I found out I was pregnant with flat top, three months later, I had his mother kept telling me, somebody's pregnant. I don't know I'm pregnant. I go to the doctor, they say, you're three months pregnant. And his aunts, Asked me, my aunt, my sister and his aunts said, go ahead, Lena, have it. It's meant to be. And I just had it. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you're very welcome, man. You're very welcome. That's your cousin. That's your cousin. And he's so, you're going you're gonna to love your cousin when you meet him. You're going to love him. You're going to love your cousin, man. You're going to love him. He's a good guy. Oh, my God. Reggie, uh. Were you concerned about being a New York dude serving time in a D.C. prison, having been convicted of, uh, for killing D.C. guys? Yay and nay. Okay, all right. So, you know, all of my co-defendants were from D.C., all right? And, you know, they were well-liked. You know, they had heart. Some of them were tough. You know, and D.C. jail, D.C. jail, make no mistakes about it. <laughs> was a serious joint, man. I'm talking about serious. Still is a serious joint, but it was a serious, serious joint. And the thing about that is all of us that were in the streets at that time that had all these issues with one another, we landed in there all at the same time. You know, all the years between 89 and 92, and maybe some may have stayed there to 93, the group that, what, that I was around in the streets. And, you know, it's a different ball game. You done checked your gun in at the precinct. So now you got to play that knife game. You could lose your, excuse me, you could, you, you could lose your life. You know, um, dudes in there, D.C. dudes, they got, they got, they do that mean. Yeah, they they, they do. hands are serious. They knuckle up. 
There they knuckle just like, up. Just like my Philly you know? brothers. So I, I, up. I learned some I learned some hard lessons in there, you know. I took I guess I had some wins and I had some losses. You know? You mean lessons. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Hard lessons. I I took some hard lessons in there. But I'm cool with that. My thing always been just lose, man. It's cool to lose. Just put your hands up. You know? If and you um, don't, that's the loss. That's yeah, and that's the lesson. So it was it was some of that going on, you know, but at the end of the day, <laughs> ain't nobody never took nothing from me, man. Whether I was from New York, wherever I was from, you wasn't taking nothing from Reg. Nothing. You could beat me to death. You could fight me. I could beat you up. I could catch a man in another unit and get him. Whatever it was, you wasn't taking nothing from me. None of that. And here's the beauty of it. All my co-defendants, every one of them, we got good relationships because we all stood up with each other. They was from out of town, man. And they, they, the government probably told them, hey, listen, we want Reggie, man. We want New York Reggie. Not my co-defendants. Not my D.C. co-defendants. Mine was great. And every other friend that I got that my co-defendants is, is tied to, they great. They don't got none of that in them. They, they ain't never told on nothing. They never will. That's who we are. You know, you you in the game, right? You in the game. And the game come with that. You know, you can't turn around and say, you know, they got this guy right now from Harlem who they who they said, I'm not going to say his name, but they got him. He he says, uh, well, they, they say this about him. He wasn't in the game. He didn't deserve that. You know, he wasn't really a street dude. My man, you so... Bricks on top of bricks on top of bricks of coke. You uh, 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 had people ODing. You was the reason other dudes would come around the block and beat crackheads up and beat cokeheads up. You was in the streets. So if you catch the flip side of it, ain't no telling and think you you going to be able to come around and say, uh, 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 well, I really wasn't a street dude. Now you was. In for a penny, in for a pound. You was you was a street. You was in the you was in that monster with us, man. You was there, and you got what happened. Trust me, I've been in a situation where my mother was pushed in. We've been pushed in three times. Yeah, three times we got pushed in. I had to listen in the bathroom as a child. I couldn't do nothing. While somebody bludgeoned my mother unconscious, man. On a robbery. On a robbery. I, I had to listen to that. Man. I ain't crying this time. Cause it's it's not it's not about tears with that one. But I listened to them. And I'm in a bathroom with a baby, so they bludgeoned her. So she was out. She was to unconscious, man. She couldn't move. For some paper. So you know, I, I know this street game, man. And, you know, and I'm not proud of it, but I I seen it, man, from, from a child. And I know all the things that dudes need to not think is slick. Don't think it's slick that you're going to run in somebody's house and bludgeon somebody's mother or aunt. Are you going to hit this many heads because you want that 50,000? You're taking a life. You're taking somebody's mother from them, man. If you get you're taking caught, somebody's aunt. that 50,000... Won't get you a lawyer worth anything. Nothing. That's gonna get you out of anything. Nothing. And then you gonna guess what you're gonna do when you get in that room? That's what you're gonna do when you get in that room, tough guy. Fold up like a shirt in a Chinese laundry. Gonna tell. Especially in this day and age. You made a point that the person you referenced made some claim that regardless of his activity, the reality was he wasn't that person. The mindset. That mindset is the prominent mindset. It's mostly represented by rappers now. They're so enamored with the lifestyle. There's a lot of them and people who emulate them that think that they can participate in this activity. They can do these things. But because it is not their truth, they somehow are not subject to the same degree of gravity. 
Because at the end of the day, I'm just pretending to be this person. And I've always been told by the good people who raised me in this good life, in this good way, that only bad things happen to bad people. So even though I'm doing these bad things, I'm not a bad person. So somehow I convince myself I'm not subject to the same degree of impact. It's psychosis. It is absolutely psychosis. And it's, and it's an oxymoronic thought pattern. Like, or rather, it's an, let me say it the right way. It's an oxymoronic mindset. Here's the wild thing. He, his self, you know, and, and, and I'm just not really going there, right? Because. Go there. No, my, my thing is this. I know myself. They say when you know yourself, they, they say when you know yourself, own yourself, right? I reached a different point in my life. So I can't, I can't even fathom the thought of this sucker, you know, saying something to me. But guess what? I'm saying so much, they, they know who he is. You know, they, they know who he is. And he doesn't say he's not a rat. He says, they say it about him. You know, because they, this is, it, it's sickening, homie. It's sickening, man. This is the thing about, this is the thing about telling, right? And it's not so much about glorifying the stand-up guy because you're the stand-up guy because you're supposed to stand up. That's right. You're not supposed to get no reward for what That's you're supposed right. to do. But at the same time, when you don't do it, and when you tell on everybody around you, or you make up lies that the government tell you to say about, because that's what they normally do. Give them a script. They give you a script, and they want you to tell it. They want you to lie on your friends, or lie on your man, or lie on whoever, or just say this. And when you say it's all right, you're teaching a child that's growing up in a house that is cool to betray somebody. Who wants to teach a child? Who wants to teach a child? That betrayal is cool. Dishonesty is cool. A coward. Of course. I don't want my child dying a thousand deaths. I got a son right now that loves me to death in Baltimore and a grandson and a new granddaughter. And I don't want neither one of them, neither one of them to think it's all right to betray somebody. It's all right to be dishonest, disloyal. That's why I'm the way I am about rats. That's why I'm taking mine to the grave with me. I don't care who you put me with. You could put me with a total stranger right now. In court, I could be facing death. It's over. I'm, I'm gone. My mother told me if we was to ever get knocked off together and they try to put me in a case with you and tell you to tell on, tell to get me out, motherfucker, do every day of your time. I'll be all right. You're going to die one death as my son. My mom told me the same exact thing. Thing as a child, brother, the same thing like that is gospel, bro. Man, that listen. is gospel, brother. Y'all got to listen. You got to listen to your mother. That's you right. right. I wouldn't she, be here she, now if I had She going to watch out for you. That's right. That's she one that you, you know was on your side. Know. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Reg, how, how did you uh, get charged with another street murder after having sat in prison for 20 years? Well, that was what I was talking about a few minutes ago. In 2012, in 2011, I'm, you know, I'm going to elaborate a little further for you. I'm sitting in New York State Penitentiary. I got about 20 years in on the 25. I'm doing great. I'm ticket free, doing every program. I'm, I'm a teacher's aide. I'm helping guys get their GEDs. Uh, I'm a college student. I done passed English 101, English 102, math, libertarian, public speaking. I'm about to get a degree. Were you doing all of that in an effort to get out of prison or in an effort to improve yourself? Both. First, I wanted to be better. I wanted to be somebody else. I wanted to look in the mirror at the end of it all and say, I like you, man. And that's what I was doing. And second, yes, of course. I was pushing extra to get out of prison because I understand how much you have to bring to the parole board because there's so many guys in New York State has one of the worst parole board systems in the nation. You go there, you can have everything, everything. You got 25 years and you ain't had a ticket in 10 years. You got college, this and that, 100 letters coming in, and they will still hit you at the board. 
So yes, I was going in. I went in. I helped guys get their GED. The teachers was writing letters for me. How how amazing I was with helping guys get their diplomas. Guys that they couldn't even get the uh to sit down with them. I said, come sit with me, man. And I'm gonna show it to you. And if you don't know it and I don't know it, we're gonna get the book and we're gonna figure it out together, homie. But you leaving out of here with that diploma. And those same guys, without me asking, when it was my turn to go before the parole board, they was coming to me, Reg, you want me to write a letter? Yeah, I need you. So that's what that was about. But let's get back to what you asked. You asked the question. I was indicted again on a federal RICO case that I had nothing to do with. A guy from D.C. that never met me, never seen me in his life said that I gave, that my co-defendant told him that he just got some drugs from me. I sent him to Harlem to get some drugs after a visit. And they charged me with uh, conspiracy to distribute a key of more of heroin and a half a brick of more cocaine. And that was their way to get me in a federal ambit. And then they grabbed the old murder and put it on there. And then the case went all the way from being a, a two-year case so it went back to 1990, and my co-defendant is involved. That's why I told you my one co-defendant said, I'm not taking no plea. This ain't no RICO case. So we all played. My, my, my co-defendant, my man, like, like my brother Damo, he took 28 years. Another good brother from D.C. named Rico, he took 28 years. And he this is how honorable he was. They offered him... 24 years prior to that. They offered to do Rico 24 years prior to that. When it was, when they came back with the plea, to for every, the different pleas for everybody, they went and told Rico, Damo is facing natural life in prison. He, Rico don't even know Damo. They told Rico, they offering Damo natural life in prison. And the only way he's going to get 28 years is if you take 28 with him. He just told them people no. He turned around and said, I'm going to take it so he don't get life. He took that on the chin for a stranger, man. That's why I got nothing but good to say about them dudes from D.C. Honor is a hell of a weight to carry, but only real men can tote that. There is no merit system except for the small group of people who've existed always that have a value for that. Other than that, that's something that you do because your nature dictates it. So big, big salute to that gentleman. Absolutely. The best that ever did it. What's up with the hoodie, bro? I, I, I see you got a nicely embroidered, mm -hmm. you know, work and all that. It's nice and... Bright, tell me about that piece real <laughs> Let quick. Let me tell you what I did today. All right, so orange is the color for anti-gun violence, all right, all over the nation, all right? Everyone knows that. So today, I decided to wear an orange shirt for in honor of anti-gun violence. And also, it's my father's birthday. It's the day I was released. It's the day that the book was released. I decided to represent my father on both sides, on the front and the back, and his name is right here. Yeah, that's dope. Can can people get those? They can get these if they if if they would like to order this. Yes, yeah. they can well, get it. Okay, where'd they go for? This was six. Not what it cost you. Oh, okay. What will you be charging for it? Uh, I would have to work that out. It's not like the book. The book is online. On, at our website or you could go to our gram but the shirt I just did it just specifically for today in honor of anti-gun violence in honor of his birthday my release and the release of the book that's I decided to wear it and like I said it's, a, it's, 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 it's both sides you can't see the back but I'll make sure you see it before I, before I leave let me see if I can turn around nah you don't have to do that now we can do that when we I got uh, you. I'll make what? sure you see it. Yeah. 
Because I, I, I see you interested in it. Absolutely. I'm getting one. <laughs> <laughs> I got to be first on the block. You know, how, you know how Harlem is. Yeah, yeah, I got you. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, the prefrontal lobe uh, at, at the forefront of our brain is where decision making happens, right? Mm. Uh, at some point, neuroscientists discovered that this area of the brain is, is where decision making process happens. Arguably, it is the most important component of the brain. But interestingly, it is the last part of the brain that develops. In males, it isn't fully developed until about 21, 22, yeah. sometimes, so, 25. sometimes 25. In females, it fully develops at around 19 or so generally, right? Oftentimes, when a guy is as young as you were gets the kind of sentence that you got, uh, they're either broken mentally and or spiritually, and they end up spending the rest of their lives in the prison medline, or they turn up the violence and wreak havoc throughout the system. How did you do your time? My time was spent, and I got through it a number of ways. First, it was my family. I had a huge family, okay? Second, I've always been a sports guy, just like my father. I love basketball, love it. So every gym that I could possibly be in, when they call rec, I was in there. I'm going. I'm rocking. While everybody else in the yard, they gossiping and talking about each other, doing what they doing, I'm playing ball, man. I'm getting through this, you know. I I, I have my music. I put my music on. I walk the yard by myself. Uh, I read like a maniac. I'm talking about read, 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 read. Just kept reading, reading, reading. And of course, I'm living in Max A prisons. This is Max A prisons for a number of 25 years. That's an unthought of number for most people to do. Most people don't make it through that without going to that med line that you just spoke of. <laughs> not me. I was I was focused. I wasn't gonna let the wall define me. I did my time and grew in there. And naturally, of course, we know it. We know the system. There's gonna be some violence. So I got into trouble. She got phone calls. <laughs> Your son is in the box. A number of times. He's in the box. You know, I done been on the phone one time with her. This is how serious she was. She's younger back then. I done been on the phone with her and told her, yo, listen, I might not talk to you tomorrow because I just got an incident, boom, 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 and I'm about to, boom. And she say, you just got an incident? Yeah. Why the fuck you still in my head then? Go, get busy first. And deal with him. Because she don't want me to, to come home in a box. So her thing was, go, man. I'll see you. I'll be on a visit. You know, so, and when Imagine I went to that bitch, the, it was like this. She came. Now, think about the opposite guy, the guy who is the guy that we were talking about earlier where he comes from a background where none of this is part of his makeup, right? None mm -hmm. of this is part of his development. Imagine what, under the same circumstances, he's on the phone, he's telling his mother, and what she's saying to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go talk to the CEO. Mm -hmm. Please, go, go check in now. And the person he actually is, that makes total sense to him. Yeah, he, he, he's what you call out of pocket. Yeah, wait. Um, ultimately, you ended up doing 30 years uh, before a judge's decision got you released. Uh, on January 20th, 2021, United States of America versus Reginald Douglas Jr. Uh, a district judge named John D. Bates provided a what they call a memorandum opinion. And for those who don't know, a, a brief opinion of a court that announces the result of a case without a lot of discussion. That's what a memorandum, that's what an opinion is in this instance. It goes like this, I'm paraphrasing it. Defendant Reginald Douglas Jr. moves for compassionate release in light of the COVID-19 pandemic and the unusual circumstances of his guilty plea. He asked the court to reduce his sentence to time served, imposing any conditions the court deems necessary for public safety. Douglas is a 50-year-old man currently incarcerated at Raybrook Federal Correctional, a medium security institution. Douglas has served almost 50 months of a 120-month sentence for second-degree murder in connection with the 1990 killing of Anthony Morrissey imposed in 2012 to run consecutive to, this, to, to a state sentence. He was 
then serving in New York for a different homicide offense. He has been incarcerated continuously for 28 years since January 1993. His current projected release date is in February 2026, and he is projected to become eligible for home detention in August 2025. This is some background on you that was mentioned in this memorandum opinion. This case is marked by an unusual and convoluted history dating back several decades. Many of the tragic outcomes of this case fall squarely on Douglas's shoulders, and the responsibility in the cruel and senseless murder of Mr. Morrissey cannot be overstated. But other circumstances outside of Douglas's control bear mention here as well. Reginald Douglas was born in 1970 in Harlem to a 15-year-old mother and a 16-year-old father with family ties to the brutally violent trade then endemic to the neighborhood. Talking about drugs, talking about the heroin gang. The thing, as we say. Mm -hmm. the thing. When Douglas was just five years old, his father was shot and killed. This caused a change in his behavior, which led his mother to take him to a psychiatrist who, quote, revealed that Reginald was suffering from trauma from his father's death, end quote. That's what the psychotherapist or the psychiatrist said. Douglas never received any psychological treatment for his trauma, even though it had been diagnosed that there was trauma based upon that situation. And he soon became involved in a drug trade at just 11 years old. After attending middle school in Virginia Beach for three years, Douglas dropped out of school before completing the, eighth, the seventh grade. Eventually, his stepfather, brought the teenage Douglas to Washington, D.C. and, quote, exposed him, end quote, to a violent environment in what was then, quote, the murder capital of the nation. In his late teenage years, Douglas was arrested on multiple occasions in the D.C. area and occurred two convictions on weapons charges in Maryland, plus an assault conviction in New York prior to the instant offense. This was a conclusion mentioned in the same opinion. The court will grant Douglas's motion for compassionate release. The unsuspected portion of his sentence, the unsuspended, pardon me, portion of his sentence will be reduced to time served, followed by the 60 month term of probation set forth in the original judgment. As a further condition of probation, Douglas will spend 270 days in home confinement. A separate order will be issued on this date. How did you first receive the news that your release had been granted, and what were your first thoughts? Okay. The night before, all right, I was sitting in a cell. So in the feds, you know, um, the, uh, in Raybrook, they have these doors, and it has windows, right? So we can stack our chairs up against the windows, and we can look at the TV, or we can just sit there. We can put our music on and... The dude that you're in the cell with, if you're in there with somebody, he's chilling, maybe reading, and you by the door in your zone. So I'm listening to music, and um, I remember the song that came on. It was um, Still Waters, Still Waters Run Deep, right, by the Four Tops. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Still Waters Run Deep, right? And I'm thinking about my family. I'm thinking about my son. In Baltimore, Anton, I'm thinking about my grandson, Braylon. I'm just thinking about life in general and, and, and what I have waiting for me at home and all the blessings in my life, right? But then I started thinking a little deeper. And, you know, it was something that had been bothering me my entire life. It ate at me, you know, because I'm with it, for real, for real, right? But in order to be forgiven, you have to really, really forgive. And it got to be real. It has to be real. So I sat on that 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 door and I'm listening to my music playing over and over. And you know, I'm not so much of a crybaby, but certain things pull emotions out of me, right? And I broke down. And I broke down and I told God, it's over. I forgive him. And I mean it. If I want you to forgive me, God, I got to believe that somebody else is different after 40 years. And I forgave him. I forgave that individual. 
And uh, incredibly, on my father's birthday, this day, the 20th, 21st, that we sitting here, they knocked on my door and they opened it. I'm laying down. And this, I remember his name. His name was uh, what was what was the case manager's name? Weldon. Me and him was half ass cool. He came to me. He said, "Hey, Doug. He had two seals with him. Yeah, he had. I remember his name. Right. His name was Weldon, case manager. And what he said was, he he had two seals with him. He said, Douglas, cuff up. We gotta take you to the hole. I said, Nah. I'm not going to no hole during no COVID. So let's let's get to it, man. He said, what? He's, he's shaking the cuffs, making the cuffs make the sound over and over. Douglas, we have to take you to the hole. I said, I'm going to tell you again. I'm not going to no hole during no COVID. I said, I'm what was not the significance? Because uh, the hole ain't no place to be under no circumstance. Exactly. But what was the significance of COVID in that instance? Oh, because we already locked down. So we only get two hours out. When you get an hour out to use the computer and an hour to shower. So if I go to the hole, I'm getting 30 minutes. And I might be in there with somebody. And I'm, I'm not doing that. But his, it was a joke. He was joking. And he said, um, I looked at him. He said, nah, Douglas, that ain't, that ain't what I'm here for. I said, what you here for, Weldon? He said, I got a call five minutes ago, man. Take whatever you're going to take with you. And come on, you got to be out this building by four o'clock. You're going home. I screamed. And everybody in the unit that seen me going to Law Library every day, right? They seen me going every day. I went every day to Law Library. Man, they called me an old bug out. Yeah, that old timer, he's, he, he, he be lunching. He, he or, you know, the DC dudes, he be lunching. Mm -hmm. um, New York dudes, Lunch. yo, he's a bug out, right? <laughs> when I walked out that cell, remember, everybody's locked in because COVID. They banged on the doors like it was a movie, and they screamed my name. And I crumbled on the steps. I couldn't even make it to the, to the office to call my mother. And I picked up. I finally got up. They, they, they let my man Calvin come over. Calvin is my man from D.C. They call him Calico. They, they let him come over from the other unit because I was stuck. They told him the COs knew who I'd be with. They went and got my man Calvin and said, go get him, man. Calvin came to the steps and said, come on, Slim. I said, what? He said, man, it's over with. We did it. He said, I'm going to walk you, man. I'm going to walk you to the back. And I got back there. And I had a few phone calls to make. And I called my mother. But she didn't pick up. It was my step. It was Red Jack. And Red Jack said, what? I said, come and get me, man. Come get me. This is over with. He said, what? I said, it's over with, man. Come get me. And he screamed. And my mother don't know what's going on. I'm going to let her tell you. She's going to tell you what, how, how it was when she heard it, right? But she crumbled. She crumbled. She, she didn't know what was going on. But let her tell you the rest. Let her tell you Please. how it was when she got that call. Yeah. So I heard Red Jack scream. I said, oh, my God, what is it? Because I didn't know what it was. Was it one of my other children? What was it? He said, lady, get yourself together. Reggie was coming home. I, my knees buckled. I was in the living room. I hit, the, I hit my, my knees. I, I kissed the floor. And I thank God. I thanked him so much. I said, thank you so much for letting my son come home and let me be here because I was concerned about being here. I used to cry about living long enough for him to get home because I knew on the come home, he needed me. And I just wanted to do that. You know, I didn't even give a damn if I, if I got him out of there and I dropped dead that night. I would have been good, man, because I did what I had to do as a parent of a child that had did 30 years. I had did it, and I was satisfied. I was so satisfied. And the lawyer told me, she said, you got to four o'clock. You should have seen us. His brothers beat 
me to the prison. And they was way in the, way deep in Jersey. And I was right there. I couldn't, have, you know, Reginald was really far, but we made it. I, all I grabbed was a sweater for him. It was freezing cold that day. All I grabbed was a sweater. When my son came out, his brother, Chauncey, got to the prison before me. I said, just put him in the car. And they brought him down, brown and thin. And I see him in the back seat. I said, just go to the gas station. When we got to that gas station, oh, my heart. Yo, y'all. Every mother that felt this, it's a beautiful thing. You know, and you feel sorry for all the other mothers that lost their children through all the shit that maybe your kid might have done. But this was my moment. This was my fucking moment. Y'all got that shit? I deserved it. I deserved the moment. I did a lot of time with this boy. I did a lot of bit. And I didn't just do it with him. I had to do it with Red. I had to do it with my son Dwayne. I had to do it with my son Corey. Everybody went to jail except Chauncey. Chauncey was the only one that stayed out. So he was always there for me. But it take a lot to deal with all of that and come out like this. I'm at peace, man. I'm at peace. There's nothing right now can, can damage my heart. I'm at peace, man. All my children is home and my husband is home. I'm at fucking peace. And I hope that whoever get this, get this in life. This is a beautiful thing. You have to remember that. I was a child trying to be a woman. I was a kid trying to be a woman. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. I was a child. I was a child trying to be a woman. But one thing I will say, I give everybody their props, each man in my life. Cisco taught me that all you have to do in life is be honorable, be honest, be honest. Flat Top taught me how to survive because he taught me how to survive. He taught me how to survive. After Cisco died, he taught me how to survive in life. And when Red Jack came along, I was able to grab onto him. He held my hand and I held his hand and we made it. And here we is 40 fucking two years later. And I'm at peace, man. I'm at peace. Leave that, man. I'm at peace. I hope everybody in the world, when they get their chance and their child come home, they be at peace. Even the ones that I don't, that I dislike. Even that family. You understand? I'm all right. I'm happy for everybody that came home. I wish them well. You know? I wish them well, man. Yeah, I wish them well. That's it. First of all, blessings to you both. So, I had the opportunity. I'm one of a, a small group of people and I'm, I'm thankful for this honor to have seen a Zoom that is, a, in our world, an historical event. It's a Zoom that um, Reggie miraculously orchestrated some time ago. And that Zoom had um, your husband, right. Red Jack, mm -hmm. um, my former running buddy, homie, um, teammate, Pistol Pete's father, the original yeah. Pistol Pete, yeah. um, um, Leonard, uh, on there. Um, cousin Ferris was on there, Lynch Mob. Shout out to Lou Samps. See you soon. Question. Shout out to the set. Lynch uh, Ferris. Absolutely. Uh, who else is on there? Jesse Gray. Jesse Gray was, was on there. Um, arguably or inarguably, his own. Um, one of the most prolific hustlers to ever do it, Mount Rushmore of the game. Yes, respectful, beautiful, a beautiful um, man. Your best friend Chucky. Yeah. Blesses that he was able to be there. And Chucky uh, emerged. Um, I don't know how deep he was in the thing, but he 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 didn't go to jail at any point. Um, 
Who else is on that call? Oh. That Zoom. His his aunt, Virginia. Yes. His and, aunt. And uh, the other gentleman, dark complected, bald head. I can't think of it. So many people. The close. Oh, Uncle G. Uncle G. Yeah, Uncle G. Right. Yes. <laughs> Uncle G stacks. That's what he calls. So. Right. So this this prolific event, you know, um, so much was said, and one of the things I recall which is why I'm bringing this up, is um, how Red Jack described that call and how this man who's known as a man amongst men, those who know Red Jack, very respected, always has been. Red Jack said proudly amongst actual gangsters, I cried like a baby. He did. I cried like a baby. He screamed. And my son called and said, come get me. He cried. He definitely cried. That's why I was scared. I thought it was something else. I didn't know Reginald was coming home. But then when I fell down on that ground, I said, what's today's date? And he said, it's January 21st. I said, God damn it, that's his fucking father's birthday. He coming home on his father's birthday. I could not believe it. And you know, when you look up 21, 21 is a day of luck. And it's quasi kept. It's been in our life a lot. You know, Cisco got killed on 21. Even though he got killed, it wasn't just a downfall. It was our, it was our gates. It was opening us up. We lost him. Yes, we lost him. But that was time for my life to move on. His life, even though it went right. It wasn't laughing. We didn't, it wasn't the greatest. But guess what? We sitting here talking to you right now. We sitting here. Reggie, once you were released, what was the first thing that you did? Okay, I got in the car. We 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 drove. We drove to uh to Harlem, but I needed to see my dad's gravesite. My mother said, you need to talk to him. And there's a picture taken of me at that gravesite when I was home because my, I went with my aunt, Virginia, and my cousin, Nini, who I call my sister. And they took me there. And um, I just got on my knees and I thanked them and I thanked them and I thanked them and I thanked them. And I talked to them. And I told them about my life. I told them how I changed it. I told him what I'm gonna do. And um <sighs> let me just say this, man. You know, and it's not that I'm it it took me a while to say it during the interview. It's just we've been talking about everything else. But what we haven't got to is how I got home. I my aunt, Virginia is the reason why I sit here right now. How so? Virginia is part of something called the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. They have lawyers on their team. They have a team that sits on the White House. They argue against injustice. And they sometimes they pick names out of a hat and they say, well, this month we're going to do this for this person that's locked up. My name was always coming up. Always coming up. So they asked Virginia, you're always talking about your nephew, Reggie. Ask him, what, ask him what's going on with his case. She asked me, and she said, send me what you got. Send me a template. I had just wrote a template, a motion, a good one. And I sent it to her, and they gave it to a lawyer by the name of Catherine Sevchenko. White lady, super cool. I don't know that she's out of D.C. She practices in D.C. I don't, look how this all fell in place. I don't know that she practices in D.C. I'm thinking she's just a lawyer that's down the National Council. they in Jersey, they're in Boston, they're in New York. I called Virginia and she said, the lady, she looked at your case and she loves it. She said, she's going to work with you. I said, how? Where's, even though she's a federal lawyer, where do she practice at? They contacted her told her what my case was at, 
She was a D.C. lawyer, man. Can you believe that? This lady was, she could have been everything. New Orleans, California. She was a D.C. lawyer. She said, I could walk your motion right into the judge. And she fought with me. That lady fought with me, fought with me. My aunt, my family, my son's mother wrote, got letters written by doctors. I mean, everybody was on a, was on a tear. My mother and them, they wrote a hundred, I had a hundred letters written to that judge, man. A hundred, yo, it's more than a hundred letters written to that judge. From doctors, from specialists, from everywhere. And they fought for me every day. Virginia, Catherine, my mother, my son's mother, my family, my aunts, my cousins, everybody fought. The judge said no the first time. He said no, he denied the motion. Yep. He denied it. But it wasn't, it wasn't denial. It was simply, I was coming home on that date. You was coming home. He was, he was coming home on the 21st. It was pushed back for the 21st. Exactly. Everything in life that you go through, it's, it's the number game. If you think back on when you lost your mom, when you lost your cousin, when you lost this one or you lost that one, just pay attention to the numbers. And it's all going to round out. Y'all understand? That's 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 what life is. Math it's all is a, it's a math. It's a number language. game. <laughs> if you take the time and pay attention to the numbers and the date that you was born and the time, it's all coming around in a circus like a clock. That's it. <laughs> that's what life is. Yeah. That's it. Let me tell you something. Today, right? Today, this date right here. I wrote a letter motion to get off of parole. Do you know, ironically, listen to this, man. The date that the judge set for this argument to be made is today. <laughs> That's bizarre. It's today. Today, the same day that I was, that he made the, the, the decision before. The and day that, you know that's connected to this, the 20, 21st. Because the dates. It's going to happen. It's, it's the dates. I'm going to wake up Monday and I'm off parole. I'm telling you that. It's over with. I'm probably off right now. I don't even know it. I want to thank my guests for giving so much of themselves. It's not easy. It's not easy to lay yourself bare before people, uh, most of whom will not be able to relate to your experiences. But because you've been so uh, articulate and so um, forthright, even if they cannot relate to the experiences, they can relate to the human experience, the human emotion. They've all experienced fear and elation and anger and disappointment and whatever the catalyst in their lives were, they understand those feelings. <laughs> And because you've been expressive about those feelings from your experiences, that helps them to connect to the experience and what it must have felt like. That brings forth empathy. That's a tremendous gift. It comes at a cost to the giver. But the value uh, on the receiver's end is uh, immeasurable. So I thank you for them, yeah. for me. Thank you. Um, you're welcome, brother. Thank you. Um, so this has been a Vlad TV, uh, you know, um, historical event. And uh, I thank everyone who's watching. We're done. And, you know, that's it. They can get part two will be available this year coming soon. You can, this can be ordered. God Bless the Child Part 1, the beginning, can be ordered at our website, www.thesiscokid116.com. And it comes with a sneak peek into Part 2. Thank you so much for having us. And let's stay in touch, brother. Let's keep changing lives. Oh, absolutely. He's, He's connected cousin. forever. He's your cousin. <laughs> forever. <laughs> the casket drops. And... Obviously, even beyond that, 